two, one. Hello everyone. Welcome to the One Favorite Outcrop. Special focus today on geothermal hotspots, but actually we have all rocks. So Susan Nash, AAPG. And really looking forward to sharing and having rocks for lunch if you're here in the, in the mid continent or any rocks for your, your uh, lunch break. So that's all good. Have good minerals in your diet. <laughs> I'm sorry, too much coffee this morning. But want to just welcome everyone and to tell you that this is a part of a, a series that we have that's um, part of a, our um, My Things Without Talk series. And it um, should be a lot of fun. So somehow, I think I have managed to not put my screen on for my um, own picture. So. Sorry about that, but anyway, want to welcome Molly Turco and welcome to be our first. So Molly is here. Awesome. Good morning. Um, hope, hope you can hear and see me okay. Perfect. I was really excited for this outcrop, especially when we had the options to submit paleo geothermal flow, um, because I've done some recent field work in a really cool mine in southwest Colorado. It's the Cashin Mine, and it's actually a sediment hosted copper mine. So in that picture there on the left, there's a yellow arrow. That's the main fault cutting through there. And then just to the right of that, you can see a bunch of fractures and some more great fractures and small faults there on the right. But what we see is that within these fractures, there's a lot of copper deposition that's represented by the green malachite, which really shows up nicely in these photos, as well as some blue azurite. And in regards to petroleum, there was two flow events. The first one was hydrocarbons that flowed through the system. And that then allowed for a reductant for the copper mineralization. And the majority of what we saw was, in with, was within the faults and fractures. So we were pretty excited about that. Um, if you could go to the next slide, I do have one more little, two more little pictures of this area that are pretty cool. The, the, there'll be a picture there on the left and that will show the Wingate it's Jurassic in age, it's an Aeolian sandstone. And you can see some of the malachite disseminated in that, in the matrix, which makes for some pretty cool geometries. And then in the picture on the right, that appears to be a fault breccia that we actually found out of place, but that showed some beautiful blue mineralization, that's azurite. And that was kind of just, showing us how the faults and all the fractures and the breccia associated with that fault, that really impacted where those minerals deposited, showing that paleo flow. I think if that was my, my three minutes. Oh, you can do some more. Okay, so can you, I, I'm having, I'm trying a different system and I'm not sure if it's- We didn't get the system. Okay, okay. I, I wasn't sure if it was just on my end or, or not. Okay, can you um, can you see the the can you see the slides? Um, no, I just for me I just see your name and your email. Okay, so let me um, stop sharing and I'll start again. Okay, so sorry, I usually don't have technical difficulties, but I changed format. Okay, now can you see it? Yes, I see the slides now. Okay, so were you able to see them before? I could see them on my end. Yes, yes, okay, they, they showed up on my screen. Okay, that's good. I can see, I can see the first one, but none of the other. Okay. Um, for some reason, I haven't. Can you see that? Can you see this one? There we go. 
Okay, okay yes, yes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about more about the copper. So you said it's malachite, and 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 so it, um, what, do you want to talk a little bit about exactly how this happened and what was going on? Um, yeah, and I, I apologize, I don't have my notes right in front of me for this this mine. There's so much that I could tell, <laughs> but as as you start to get oxidation of those sulfide minerals they can um, go to different types of minerals. And one of the ones that really stand out in this mine is the malachite, because it's this beautiful green color, as well as the azurite, which is this beautiful blue color. So when you go there, that's, that's kind of the first thing that catches your eye. You start to see these fracture planes, and then you can kind of scrape your fingernail almost and scrape off some of that malachite. And that that's where you tend to get the highest concentration of that mineralization. And then the miners, what they can do is they can mine that rock, rock and basically take it to a processing facility and get the, the copper out of there um, that will use, eventually go into things like copper wire or battery, things like that. And this mine, I, I forget the exact dates, but this was mined, I think from the late 1800s to about the 1920s and then off and on till about the 1940s. So it's a very old mine. When you go there, you can see some of that old, um, some of the old building materials, the old bunker houses and things like that. You can see a big area where the main mine was, which is unfortunately blocked off. And you can see several other small holes, which is what we saw in that first picture. And what they did is they mined right along that main fault and then along that fault plane within there. Um, but thankfully- That's really interesting. Yeah, thankfully a lot of it is still exposed. So you can go there today. You need a four wheel drive vehicle to get there, but you can, I mean, you can go there freely and take a look at the structure. You can see the fractures and the faults and all of the mineralization that's around those as well. So um, for those who might have not caught it, where exactly is this? So this is, Southwest Colorado, it's very close to the Yurvan district. Um, if, if you've ever been to Moab in Utah, you can drive south for maybe an hour, a little bit less. There's the town Monticello. So that's where we stayed. And then we drove about an hour back east into Colorado. And then just off that main road, there's a little, there's a, a dirt road that goes south and that's where the mine is. You can type it into Google Earth or Google Maps. You can type in cash in mine and it shows up. Um, and when we went, it was open. I, a lot of people have been there, um, but the, the road is kind of rough. So I do recommend a four wheel drive or something with big tires. That's super interesting. And I think what's fascinating is to see how, how the hydrothermal deposits the, 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 and the, the hot um, fluids basically created the, the, the ability to have this mineralization and do the concentration. And, and they it works along the, the bedding planes as well as fractures. Yeah, definitely. There's the LaSalle Mountains that are an igneous intrusion. And the thought is that when those intruded, that out allowed enough heat and geothermal fluids within the area, um, which is kind of the source for when this this copper rich fluids flowed through this system. Well, so I'd like to invite anybody who's on in, in attendance to go ahead and, and um, feel free to, to um, unmute and ask questions or share your experiences with, with, um, with mining or mineralization hydrothermal deposits. Yeah, well, we have shy people today. <laughs> that's that's fine. This is just really interesting. I I, I think that that um, obviously in Arizona there there are like the classic copper mines and Bisbee, a lavender pit, etc. And it's, and and I think even in Oklahoma there's been a little bit of copper. I can't remember where. I think it's yeah, west. Not as pretty, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Cupride or something. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Molly. Yeah, thank you too. So I have um, have the slide deck with things that people sent ahead of time. 
But if anybody is in the audience who'd like to, to share their screen, just let me know. And, and if you want to share right now, that would be great. And I'll just um, make you a co-host. So I was going to ask if, um, I see that, that um, Rondi Martinson is in the audience if you'd like to share anything. And if not, we'll just go back up to the, post for the slide deck and let's just move up. So, so the David Cook, um, let me know if you can see this, David Cook um, shared a really interesting geothermal um, hotspot in Iceland, classic one. And he's is basically showing how they get the geothermal energy. So he, he's saying Iceland sits astride mid-Atlantic Ridge. And if any of you have been there, you've probably gone to near Keflavik. You can go and just like um, east of Keflavik, you can actually walk and there's like signposts saying this is the, um, this is the mid the Atlantic spreading ridge, and you can actually just walk across different plates. They're pretty interesting. But anyway, he was saying that most of this, much of the space heating in the capital of Reykjavik is powered by hot geothermal water from plants sited adjacent to dormant volcanoes in the vicinity. And so essentially, um, they pump in brine or seawater and then just um, place and then inject it onto the essentially magma, and it, it not surprisingly turns into steam. <laughs> and then it, it generates electricity, but it also actually, they, they actually pump the steam into the radiators. So that there's a, a large cryptocurrency data mining operation in Iceland. When I was in Iceland, they still had a lot of uh, aluminum, I was gonna say aluminum, aluminum um, processing, because they were able to do that because of low cost electricity. So there, it was considered um, a really great place to bring in the ore, the bauxite, and then, then process it and then ship it to the European market. But that, that shut down um, a few years ago, not sure why. Well, obviously probably for economic reasons. And the images show an active geyser and hot springs at geyser 40 miles east of, of Reykjavik. Reykjavik's in the southwest part of Iceland. So that's, that's interesting. Any comments or thoughts from, from the audience? So anyway, um, okay, so our next, next slide is uh, Vikram Yada is in India, sent us a number of, of really interesting um, pictures that he took. And there, there's essentially more fluvial um, uh, features, so they're pretty interesting. And so he's showing the ripple marks in the banks of the Bokaro River. And it's in Jharkhand, which is a part of India. So the description is, here are some current ripple marks unidirectional ripples. So their asymmetrical ripples are asymmetrical in profile. And then he's showing that there's a gentle up current slope and a steeper down current slope. The down current slope is the angle of repose, which depends on the shape of the sediment. You know, this, this is a really good example of why it's so important to understand and see analogs um, in in nature is to give an understanding, have an understanding of what's going on in the subsurface and that sedimentological models. And here he sent um, lumps of coal with shining sand grains flowing in the Bokaro River. And basically he's talking about coal being um, combustible substance formed by the partial decomposition of vegetable matter without free access to air and under the influence of moisture, and often increased pressure and temperature. It's widely used as a natural fuel. Well, it was more widely used, I would say, <laughs> unfortunately. 
Any comments? Is anybody um, specialized in coal or coal bed methane? Any thoughts about um, coal bed methane or coal? And okay, so here um, is an example of mechanical erosion of the sand, sandstone outcrop due to the geological action of, of the river. So this again is in Talaswar, Jharkhand. It said that it's due to the forces inherent to the flow of running water during the hydraulic action of the river. Sandstone outcrop has been eroded. So anyway, so it's due to the gradient. So this is you know basic nice things that you can show students in the introduction to geology and then get back in there and do even more. And here's a, he's at a beach in the Bokaro River and he's describing what a beach is. So anyway, materials such as sand, pebbles, rocks, seashell fragments cover the beach. Um, the beach materials products of weather and erosion. So it's like he's been looking at the larger class. And here's um, medium fine grain sediment deposited. And he has um, basically taken a picture of, of essentially the depositional pro processes and, and I guess, you know, looking at varying um, energy levels causing sometimes the fine grain to fall out of suspension and sometimes a larger grain. Does anybody want to take a look at this picture and describe what you think has been the history of the, the energy in that stream? So Rhonda, you're, you're on. Would you like to take a, ch a chance or Take a shot at this. She may not be listening. Anybody else would you like to? John Wheeler, would you like to? Hmm, no, I, it's hard to see. Looks like there's some pretty sizable gravel in there. Yeah. And then there's some fine grain stuff that looks stuck together pretty good. So I don't know what the. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I can't really interesting tell. Mix. It is. I can't really tell if those are actually in kind of bedded. It's hard to tell if that's bedded or not. I, I would doubt it. But... I don't know. Yeah. Dexter, do you want to take a. Shot it, talk about it. Mm -hmm. Looks like maybe some ripple marks are forming there. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another picture where he's taking it. How this is sort of interesting, too. You have an erosional remnant that he's, he's standing, sitting on. And um, it's kind of surprising when you see erosional remnants of, of kind of a smaller size. Has anybody been to um, um, Bryce Canyon? The hoodoos? Those are pretty interesting. When you talk about erosional remnants or views. Has anybody um, been to any of the um, erosional remnants and uh, buttes around in Northwest Oklahoma? So anyway, this is in the Motur Formation and it's Middle Permian. Also in... Uh, Oh, for what? Welcome. Good morning. Yeah. In India. Yes. That's great. Yeah. We have a little bit of challenge with the connection there. It's called barren measures because we are not getting any coal there. Hmm.
And Pravat, thank you. Here's another. Thank you. Well, I think Pravat was, I don't know if he has a uh, good enough connection. Well, at any rate, uh, Vikram provided, this is pretty interesting in terms of historical um, information. So this is a check dam of a stream in Koilang, Jharkhand. And it's a, he said that a check dam is a small, sometimes temporary dam constructed across a swale, drainage ditch, or waterway to counteract erosion by reducing water flow velocity. So see the check dams are not a new type of technology, but they're ancient techniques dating from the second century. I didn't know that. That's quite interesting. It dates back so long. So we have, um, so we have, so here's here are Molly's again. So you know, we'll go to them. Oh, whoops. So let's go back up here. We had um, so we didn't have too many people who who su submitted ahead of time. Um, so would anybody like to share your screen and find uh, your favorite outcrop like online and we can share? Uh, yes, good good morning. This is uh, Ken Williams. Hey, Ken. hi Ken. Okay, um, let me share my screen and. Um, okay, I'm making you a co host. Okay. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, I think I just made you a, a host. You should be able to. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and we will select this screen to share which is a Kodachrome Basin in... Um, oh, this is amazing. Yeah, this is a state park in, uh, in uh, Utah. And it is, um, it is a spectacular area. This, um, this, this large white formation is an injected sandstone. And there's a whole series of these injected sandstone dikes that are scattered around the park. Um, there's the entrance, and this outcrop is in this reddish formation back in here with the injected dikes into, into there. Um, trailhead, winter scene. This is just from, these are just, is what's posted in Google. Um, so I'm just showing the, the Google image. There's one right back in here that's isolated. There's one that's closer. Some of them are red, some of them are white. Um, here's one with, uh, again, the, the, the large injectite. Um, this is uh, Grosvenor Arch or Grosvenor Arch. Uh, Grosvenor Arch, um, it's in the, in the park or just a little bit to the east of the park. It's a horizontal arch. Um, it's like the, um, the, the one that's in um, Arches, or in Canyonlands National Park, it's called Paul Bunyan's Potty. <laughs> there is some, there is some residual. Um, I don't know whether it's tar or um, or uh, or some sort of a, some sort of a, a subsurface fluid staining the rock in places. The views are spectacular from the park. This one has a couple of these. There, there's a whole bunch of them scattered around through the various places in the park. This slide's got a couple of them. Um, very uh, interestingly eroded um, vertical. That you've got the dikes, but you don't have the sills. There seems to me when I was there, there were a few places where you could see a little bit of a of a of the sill uh, from the injectite. So that's what uh, that's what uh, Google shows for um, Kodachrome Basin State Park. 
That's really interesting. I, I love it. Is there anyone else who would like to um, share? Um, sure, Susan. Okay, great. Put that on my list to go see though. Okay, somehow I have, okay. So um, is there anybody else who would like to share? Yes, Susan. Okay, okay, great. John, I see you. Let me find you on the list and I'll make you a co-host. Oh, I'm not seeing you on the list. There you are, sorry. Actually, the easiest way may be to just allow all participants or multiple participants to share simultaneously and then that's true. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Um, uh, right click on the uh, on the carrot by share screen, and then you get mm -hmm. the options. Okay, great. Okay, Ken, I, I made you um, co host. Okay, go. So John, you should be able to. Um, let's see here. I'm not getting a, oh, there we go. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, okay. Yeah. Can, everyone, can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Uh, you probably recognize this place. <laughs> it's, yes. uh, for, for those who aren't here, this is, this is Oklahoma. And um, I, like, I like thermal anomalies, and there are different kinds of thermal anomalies. There are anomalies that are due to um, burial heating, uh, and we see that reflected in, in uh, vitronite reflectance. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are hydrothermal anomalies where you have deep fractures that allow hydrothermal fluids to come up and heat the rocks, and you also get uh, maturity anomalies out of those. But what we're talking about here today is um, uh, uh, geothermal, uh, basically areas of the crust that are hotter than other areas of the crust. And one way of mapping uh, geothermal is to map the geothermal gradient, which in this case for US standards, it's, uh, this is represented in uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit change increase per 100 feet. And the interesting thing that comes out of this data is that there is a geothermal anomaly uh, very close to the city of Tulsa, and it's basically a north-south. I would, if I had to give it a name, I'd call it the Catoosa, well, it's east of Bartlesville, so the Catoosa Nawada uh, thermal anomaly. Um, and this data, by the way, comes from the SNU um, geothermal lab. So I'm always curious, you know, we know Osage County, and I'll show you the the Osage County maturity map here. This is vitronite reflectance, and let me throw some faults on here. I'm always looking for a cause for these hot rocks and this hot water. And uh, so Osage County has, a, has, a, has a, a vitronite anomaly, and it's got deep faults, and we think they're deep faults, uh, these uh, ones going through here. It also has lots of, lots of, there are lots of, Oklahoma is full of faults, and if I throw them all on the map, you can just, you can see how dense they are. Uh, and these are, have been at one time mapped or another. But you notice where that, where that hot anomaly sits, which is right over here, there really aren't any faults mapped. So the question is, wh why do you have an anomaly there? Well, the best answer that I've come up with is when you look at basement structure. And so if you throw basement structure on here, you get a map that <clears throat> shows a couple of highs that are imperfectly related to our, uh, to our geothermal anomaly. And the explanation for this is when basement rock, when granite is closer to the surface, the, uh, the gradient will be larger than it if, if it is much more buried deeply. And that's because the, of the amount of insulation that you have lying on basement. Basement is the source of heat. And when you have less insulation, 
heat escapes faster and you have, you have a higher geothermal gradient. So this kind of, it kind of explains it, except it's not a, really a great correlation either because the, the feature actually kind of goes north south through here. So I, I'm, I'm soliciting all, all opinions on this at this point and uh, would be happy to hear from anyone who has, has any ideas about why this, um, uh, why this uh, geothermal anomaly exists where it does. And I'll turn it, I'll turn it back on here. I, I would wager a guess, but I noticed Rick Fritz, our, our president's in the audience now. Rick, I'd like to welcome you. And also, um, I'm, I'm just wondering, well, okay, this is near the lead zinc area. And it's a Mississippian type of, if you look up, um, Mississippian embayment type of min mineral structure. It, it is, and that's, uh, you know, we think Osage County, which has the vitronite anomaly and the mapped basement faults, re real or imagined, that, that that is an area where there's been actual hydrothermal alteration um, and um, some of the people who have worked Osage are more knowledgeable about the ro what the rocks are there. There's some there's some some anecdotal evidence for that for that alteration. Besides just the uh, besides just the uh, uh, the maturity anomaly. Let me show you one other thing on here too. Uh, one other layer that will kind of open your eyes. That um, vitronite anomaly that you see up in up in Osage County looks like this on gravity and let me let me move the culture around so you can see it a little better yeah i mean it's a it's a bullseye uh but again here's your here's your hot uh here is your geothermal anomaly sitting over here uh your basement uh highs kind of arc in like this so there's a lot going on in here and they all may be related to one another, but they're not laid down. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation of all the heating events uh, through time. John, you know, this is Rick. There's another anomaly there, and that's kind of the north and around that area is helium, the presence of helium. Um, I just wonder if that's related somehow. Yeah, helium, helium comes from the basement. It's the daughter product of uranium decay the alpha particles. And uh, uh, if you were going to explore for helium, you would certainly, uh, 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 you would want to drill gra weathered granite or granite itself. The problem with helium, it's a very small molecule uh, or particle and it, it's fugitive, it tends to escape. And so if you think about the naturally, natural occurrences of helium, where they are, they're, as far as I know, and I don't know them all, but uh, if you look at Southwest, uh, the Panhandle in Southwest Kansas, for example, you have thick evaporites and you really do need uh, liquid salt to seal something like, like a helium molecule. These are, these are much smaller than methane molecules and um, uh, are, very, are very hard to, uh, to trap naturally. So uh, Osage, as far as I know, it has shale, but helium will go through the pores in shale. So um, that that is one that is one thing to uh, to keep in mind. Um, Molly has a good comment. Uh, Molly, would you like to to open your mic and and, and chat about it? Sure, I can expand on that. Um, I was working with a student from OU and OSU, and he did a lot of work using gravity and magnetic data, mostly magnetic data, and they've identified what they call ring dikes um, in Northeast Oklahoma. I'm not sure exactly where on that map. I don't know if you have magnetic data, but I know there's some in Northeast Oklahoma, and I know there's some just to the southwest of the Nemaha Fault near the southwest corner of your map. And geometry-wise, they're analogous to what cropped out in Missouri. And I, I think it's the St. Francis Mountains. There's something possibly analogous out there. Um, I, spatially, I'm not sure if it overlaps, but I just thought it was a comment I could throw out there. And I think I still have your email. I can 
find those references and send them to you whenever I'm thinking about it. I want to jump in here and share something really quickly and then I'll go back to you. Um, but um, let, I'll go back to you, John. But um, I think that if we look at the, there's a USGS, well, I guess I don't need to, you guys can look at it, but there's a USGS. Well, I'll go ahead. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, USGS publication. Oops, I'm showing the wrong thing. And it's um, basically, okay, can you see this? Can you see the um, deposit, deposit model for Mississippi Valley type lead zinc ores? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so th this, is, this is free on the web, <laughs> thanks to USGS. But what's interesting is it has a um, has a map of of the um, of the world, which shows the Mississippi Valley type of uh, deposits. Or these are lead zinc, but the mechanism is the same. And these are are areas of heat flow, and they almost always correspond to intense mineralization. But what's fascinating too is that there's also um, it, they correspond to, to um, energy that's used in, in basically cooking kerogen and, and, and creating, um, generating oil, hydrocarbons. So there, there's, it's just kind of fascinating to see this, this mechanism. I'll go back to you, John. You, want to, you can reshare again. Yeah, it's uh, it's something I've you know I've always pondered because I I kind of made my living finding and uh, working on um, uh, uh, thermal hotspots basically, and these I located using organic matter, and uh, typically if we would get a sales package from a company, they always like to have a bullseye that they could they could sell to us, and uh, uh, sometimes well they sometimes they had one and didn't know it. Um, the only way that you find them with organic matter is to take enough samples at a dense enough grid that they that they come out. Osage County is unusual in that it's huge. I mean, it takes up almost the entire county, but a typical uh, thermal anomaly uh, may be only the size of a township or smaller. And so, in order to locate it using a typical sampling sampling program, you'd have to you'd you'd have to take a lot more samples than what Brian Cardot took for his vitronite map. So, uh, but uh, we we found the biggest one. I have no doubt about that. Um, also about the the relationship between basement faulting and hydrothermal fluids and elevated thermal maturities. Um, there's a lot of places in Oklahoma, the Nemaha Ridge is one, and the Nemaha is in an area where the Woodford is cold. I mean, it's not barely cooked into the oil window, but I've always wondered if you had a better map and more data, if you might actually find some thermal anomalies within, within the Nemaha. It's worth a, it's worth a look anyway. That's cool. So Pravat um, Kumar Pradhi is mentioned in the, in the chat, that he says it's nice to be part of an informative meeting. It says India is taking up exploration of geothermal resources in the Ladakh region, part of the Himalayan belt. belt. Singh Pravat, do you want to comment on that? Let's see if your internet is a little bit. Yeah, recently there is a news uh, that they will be carrying out uh, geothermal exploration in the Himalayan belt, that is particularly around region. Recently, we have carried out uh, gas exploration. We got some uh, marginal success. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Well, thank you, Prabhai. Thank you. Thank you. That's cool. So Clint Tippett is asked about the Iceland geothermal. Is there a big heated aquifer in the altered volcanics, perhaps charged ultimately from the ocean that negates the need to inject water? And on a related note, what do they do with produced water once the thermal energy has been stripped out? 
Well, I don't know about the answer for the first one, but I do know the answer for the second one. Uh, there's a, a place called Blue Lagoon, and they, they basically put that um, water, the, um, the produced water, in and it makes a cooling pond. So you can go and, and you pay money <laughs> to have these magical healing waters. And so, I, of course, I fell for it. So I went there. And what it will do is if you have color treated hair like I do, like bleached, <laughs> It will solicify your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and so my hair, I lay down in like this like thing. I went ahead and tried like, well, I don't, just let, you know, anyway. So basically my hair was like, like a fiberglass for until it grew out. <laughs> anyway, anybody have any answer for the heated aquifer and the altered volcanics? Any answer to that? So um, I noticed that Daniel Flores is in the audience. And, um, I think you're in, in Peru, right? Daniel? Yes. Yes, Susan. Hi. Oh, great. Would you want to talk a Thank little you. about the geology in, in Peru and some of the things that your favorite outcrops there? Uh, repeat me in Spanish, please. Oh, okay. Man, quisieras comentar sobre sobre uh, las rocas o las formaciones geológicas en en Perú. Eh, de momento no tengo nada preparado, pero este quizá una oportunidad próxima puedo mostrarles incluso imágenes eh, de muy buenos afloramientos que hay en el noroeste. En, en la, okay, he said we. He doesn't have anything ready at the moment, but he'd like to in the future. And he said there's some really interesting stuff, especially in the north, northeast, or noroeste or noreste? Noroeste. Noroeste, uh, in the northwest. Eólicos, desérticos, hay muy buenos afloramientos acá. Oh, okay, so there's really interesting uh, aeolian things in the north, north, northwest. It's cool. Anybody else would like to, to share? Sí, de momento es todo. Gracias. No, oh, no, you're welcome. So thank you. Gracias. Es un gusto hablar contigo con usted. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to speak with you too. So, um, Rick, would you like to talk a little bit about some um, outcrops that you, you enjoy? The, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I haven't been to too many outcrops of late uh, because of the, uh, <laughs> the COVID, although that really uh, shouldn't have stopped me. My, uh, one of my uh, favorite outcrops is, it's in the Arbuckle Mountains because it shows a pretty complete section of the uh, the carbonates in Oklahoma and all the cycles and so on. And we've, we've spent many, many hours studying that. And uh, it's, uh, it's got a lot of karst features and so on. And it's all vertical. So it uh, makes it really easy to measure and so on. Where, and, do, do, uh, can you find it online? I can find it for you. No, I don't have I I don't have anything uh, right now with our on our buckles that I could grab. But it's a uh, it's a it's a great outcrop and in, uh, in southern Oklahoma. So anytime there's a field trip to it, I'd recommend it if you like carbonates. Yeah, there's a Delisi quarry that's pretty good. Yes, lots of fractures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, there's a what Susan mentioned. There is a quarry in there. It's a uh, and the Swirl Livonians exposed right there, and I take engineers to it because um, it has just tremendous fracture profile. And every time I've taken en engineers into it, they say, "I didn't know it. I had no idea fractures looked like that." So it's um, it's. I'm not sure what they thought fractures would look like, but uh, they sure didn't think it was uh, quite as crazy and uh, as that is. So, but anyway. And and I'm I'm sharing my screen of the Arbuckles. One of the nice things about the Arbuckles is that you can definitely see tilting and you basically um, understand the structural history by looking looking there. Um, so there's another. Yeah, they're great exposures, although they're, yeah, that's one of the quarries there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful fracturing 
uh, in that. So um, the sad part, though, they're kind of uh, getting overgrown and so on. And, uh, no, you know, it's, it's getting a little harder to see the outcrop last time I passed through there. But yeah, since they're not they're not active quarries anymore, I think that's the key. Yeah. One of the uh, my favorite people of all time, some of you knew him, is James Lee Wilson. Uh, he just he was one of those that always, always was looking for outcrops. And um, um, his wife, Dell, uh, she was uh, he he claims every time he left for a long trip to look at uh, outcrop more than two weeks, she'd buy a new car. So um, I was uh, driving through the Arbuckles one day and I looked over there and this, there was this uh, man measuring section by himself. And uh, I slammed on the brakes, pulled over and sure enough, it was Jim. I was just driving through and um, I uh, asked him about Dell, his wife. And I looked over and she was in a brand new, uh, brand new car sitting on the side of the road, so. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So is, would anybody else like to um, chat a bit about, um, Clint, would you like to talk a little bit about some of your um, impressions of uh, geothermal? No, I don't have anything today, Susan, I'm sorry. Okay, oh, no problem. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay, so, um, so Rick, you went to to uh, Yellowstone a few years ago, didn't you? Oh yes, yeah. It's one of my one of my favorite. Well, I usually stay in the Tetons. The, the weather's usually a little better there during certain times of the year, and uh, then I uh, drive up at the Yellowstone. So, did you go to any of the hot springs? Oh yeah. Yeah, the um, it's that's one of our favorite. Uh, it's kind of a morbid curiosity too, because there's also a book you can buy at the park talking about how many people died in the hot springs. So most often, uh, people are walking their dogs, and their dogs jump in, and they jump in after it. Oh uh, no! Bad choice. So yeah, there's quite a few bad accidents on that. Well, I'm sharing the wrong screen. I meant to to share screen one but then i came came across for some reason it's sharing what happens to your um oh here it is <laughs> that's terrible every time i try to to share this image it goes to the article well anyway bloggers yeah. walked on yellowstone hot springs yeah, we can see some definite issues here. Well, that's that's why uh, you know you have to really control young children and and dogs have to be on a leash if you're uh, walking around that area. What's amazing to me is that they they allow people to walk so close to it. Well, I guess there's not that many accidents. <laughs> people are pre usually pretty careful around boiling hot water, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, like at least say, a rail. Yeah, young children. Uh, well, the the problem is the uh, the way, reason they do, I ask about that very thing. They don't have rails because the uh, moose and other animal uh, walk through there, and they just uh, get caught or tear up the rails all pieces, so they can't really have rails. Wow. So here's somebody cooking chickens in the hot springs. Well, <laughs> his name was Sanders. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, um, in the in the chat, let me know if, if there's are any um, any types of uh, things you'd like me to look up, and we can we can share like in your your favorite things. I talked about Bryce Canyon. Um, Zion National Park has a lot of has a lot of uh, um, like avalanches, which is kind of interesting. If you if you ever want uh, go into the Utah, you know the the parks there, 
the federal parks and the state parks in Utah, uh, there's a fantastic geologic book that uh, I know uh, one of my good friends, Tom Chidsey, uh, edited and uh, they, that they put together. And you can get it usually in the bookstores. And but it's a gr great geological analysis of the of Zion and and uh, Bryce and Canyon Lands and and uh, Arches and all that. So uh, it's a book well worth having. Uh, it's fun just to do a big circle in in um, Utah and just go to all those parks and use that book. Well, I mean, here's a, a really interesting picture of a slot canyon. That's a pretty in intense one. Mm. And then just being able to, to see, um, well, I mean, like just looking at this, what are some of the features that you can see just that anybody want to um, point out what you can see? Obviously. Oh, cross beds, there's tons of cross beds. Yes. This yeah. area, a lot of it looks like Mars. Mm-hmm amazing how much it looks like Mars. And the, the Navajo sandstone is one that has like has the big red beds and cross beds. It's pretty interesting. But if you're in Zion, take a big old canteen of water because especially in the summer because it is hot. Definitely. Yeah, um, one of my favorite areas I don't know, have, has anybody been to Devil's Tower? Yeah. Yeah, that's a uh, really interesting uh, outcry, or basically, um, I'll stop showing you. Uh, I met some aliens there one time. <laughs> let's, see, let's get some in the chat. I don't think Dexter believes that. I, I met a motorcycle gang there once. Okay, Frenchman. Okay, Frenchman Mountain. We'll look up that. Okay, um, Stephanie Kiefer, would you like to share your screen? I'll make co-host. Well, I, actually, I'm on my cell phone. If you might just look it up, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah I'm on my cell phone. I, I didn't know this was happening today. I came in late, so I just thought it might be a cool one to um, take a look at. It's a highly faulted. Uh, uh, Mesozoic section, Paleozoic section, um, just east of Las Vegas. Uh, you can go to Google Earth and look at the outcrop from, you know, however high up. Um, and also the Keystone Thrust, which is just west of Las Vegas, you can see it as you come, you know, as you come in, say, if you're on a flight coming in, um, you can see it just out the window at, of the airplane or, or at the airport. Uh, both of those are really cool. Okay, so see, so I've found it. Um, so we've got the trailhead here. But there's Frenchman Mountain, Sunrise Mountain. Is your uh, Mount Charleston is like is west of Las Vegas? North. Yeah, Mount Charleston. Uh, the Keystone Thrust and Mount Charleston are in the Spring Mountains, which is west okay. of Las Vegas. And Frenchman Mountain is actually between uh, Lake Mead and Las Vegas to the east. And okay. I think um, the. Uh, uh, Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology has a pretty cool uh, uh, map and, and, and uh, uh, things on their website covering that. I think there's, uh, I think, I haven't actually been there in 30 years, but I think since I was there last, they put in some markers um, on the road. So, you know, you can go to Frenchman Mountain and kind of see some of these things if I, if I have remembered correctly uh, what I read. Well, we found a really cool, um um website is uh with frenchman mountain and it's a person it's called bird and hike.com oh yeah okay yeah and they're talking about the the frenchman mountain trail and they're saying that it it looks pretty easy but it's not actually <laughs> yeah well yeah probably not i mean and then definitely like rick was talking about with with utah if you're out there in the summer go in the morning or go in the evening and take a lot a lot of water um well, and, but and it's this, pretty spectacular. And this is a, here's something that they're saying, like oh, well, I'm, you know, expletive deleted, but saying that it's a lot harder to go downhill than I'm 
their advance and expertise in music don't work. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Anyway, it, it, they, um, it's so hard to see you break an ankle. Yes. Yeah. You can slide if, the, if you got a lot of gravel. It can be. I guess those walking sticks would be a good thing to have. Yes. In fact, he even says that to, um, slipping on a steep road is a constant hazard. Um, trekking poles are a good idea. Watch your footing on the summit. East face is abrupt and steep. And they don't, it doesn't look that bad, but I've noticed that they have um, poles. Yeah, yeah. And in that same area, I just remembered there's the Valley of Fire. Uh, there's- uh, Oh, that's, yes. That's also very spectacular. And I think, um, you know, that's in the Aztec sandstone. And I think there's also uh, petroglyphs in yes. the Valley of Fire or just north of there on kind of the north uh, Overton arm of Lake Mead. Well, there's also an area in Henderson, there's a, a, a really cool little, uh, and it, it was it was hard to keep one's footing. It was it's very gravelly. And I wasn't wearing hiking boots. I really regretted it. But um, it you think you have to work out, walk, always be vigilant for snakes as well. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, it, that area is best to go in like the fall or the spring <laughs> yes. if you're going to be out walking around a lot. But there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some pretty good pictures on this um, on this we website. They, he did a good job. Of, um, yeah, those are great. Aren't they interesting? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. the view of Las Vegas. Right. Running out of water. And when I worked out there 30 some, well, 35 years ago, Las Vegas was separate from Frenchman Mountain. And now I think it's just grown. It's filled up that entire valley. Um, it's crazy. Wow. That is. Well, I mean, Henderson used to be pretty far away and separate. Right. And it was more of an um, industrial place because when I worked for Kermagee Chemical, that's where it um, okay. had a, a, a chemical plant there. But yeah, it, those are great pictures. I guess, yeah. Well, this has been um, fun and, and relaxing. I, <laughs> I tried, I, I set up a different computer setting as so I do two monitors and I, I forgot that my um, camera was in my laptop that was shut and it was so, I was like, why is there no image? So, so <laughs> yeah, it's just me talking and no image, which is probably better, <laughs> but that explains it. So I had to figure out how to get suddenly get back to that. But um, there's always some kind of interesting technical challenge in, in doing these webinars. So right. Well, you guys are doing a good job, I think. Mm -hmm. And and this has been a really good idea. I'd like to hopefully you'll do another one of these uh, favorite outcrop things. Yeah, we do. We'll have more. Um, Let's see, let me stop sharing here. And let's see. Oh, Jermak in Armenia. Okay, um, Huri Elezian, would you like to open up your mic and, and I'll make you a, a, a and I'll Google Jermuk really quickly. Okay. So, um, Uri, would you like to chat? Yeah. Well, he may have connectivity. Well, I'm going to, to Google. Yes, uh, please, because I, I don't have pictures, uh, personal pictures. They are all on Google. So, uh, since the topic of our uh, subject today is uh, hot water springs, hot the hot zones. Mm -hmm. I thought of it. Just a quick, uh, quick look at it because I haven't prepared actually. Okay, so can you see it? Yes. This is super beautiful. Yes, it is a spa town. People go there. It's a tourist. I want to go. <laughs> it's a touristic place, and uh, there is the. I don't know uh, if you have other pictures. Uh, there is the waterfall. Oh my! Yeah, the, the waterfall is up here. Okay, so I'll see if I can. And, and and there are also hot water, 
geysers, if you can uh, find it, I don't know. Uh, I have one uh, video uh, on Facebook, I found it. It's in... Uh, wow. This is beautiful. Whoops. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the picture of this uh, beautiful animal, it's because the, the place is full of animals. Ah. I'll find a different one. Let's see. Here's some more pictures. Wow. Wow. This is. Yeah, yeah this is beautiful. Is yeah, it, it is. I, yeah, the uh, Caucasus. That's amazing. It's so beautiful. Yeah, you can. Uh, if you want, I can gather more subject about it. Uh, I have to translate from Armenian, but there's enough subjects on the on Google if you can find. Well, wow, this is beautiful. So this is the, the Caucasus Mountains and then the hot springs. Wow. Yeah. I'm finding more of the more of the oh, how pretty. So it looks like it's in a, it, uh, highly eroded. Uh, I don't know. I ha I haven't visited the area, but uh, it is still active, like uh, hmm. hot water still gushing. Wow. Yeah, I'm looking at photos here. I don't know. Can you see, can everybody see them? I, I don't know. I never can tell if it's sharing the right screen. Let me see again. So can you see the, the photos of of the water? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, this okay. is the main waterfall. This is a church. Oh, yeah, this is a typical. This is the Armenian, Armenian church. church, typical. Mm -hmm. Yes, typical architecture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So pretty. Well, that this is a really beautiful way to to uh, finish up the the our hour of, of exploring outcrops together and having um, oh how beautiful yeah this is the Ararat Mountain I think I, yeah oh it my is, goodness it is the Ararat Mountain wow now is Chorvira uh, of the church so is it considered to be oh it's supposed to be considered holy and uh, holy yeah. They say that Noah's Ark landed on it. Yes. So it's really interesting. They fit a lot of photographs here. I think it would take us a long time to go through all of them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for suggesting it because we. Yes, can... you can explore yeah. further. Yeah, this exactly. is wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's really, really appreciated. Yeah. Yeah, um, Vern Stefanik says um, had, he had never heard of Jermuk. How do you pronounce it correctly? I, I know I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. Jermuk. 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 Okay. Yes, and the, ger the word germ in Armenian means warm. Oh. Warm water. Warm. Warm water. Okay. Yeah. And, um, in Azerbaijan, in northern Azerbaijan, there's a place called Ilesu, which means warm water. It's all in the Caucasus, so I guess there's. <laughs> yeah, it's full of it. There. <laughs> wow. Well, I just um, want to thank everyone. We're pretty, pretty much out of time, so I just want to go ahead and give Rick our the last words and thank thank him for being our fearless leader, APD. Rick, you're muted. Yeah, my my mouse cursor was all over the place, so I had one of its own. So uh, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Susan, especially for these. Uh, I won't be your fierce, fierce leader for much longer. I have uh, 
Uh, I like about five days left. Gretchen will be taking over. So um, um, please give her the support you've given to me. And I uh, really appreciate uh, everyone. And uh, like I say, these, these have been a lot of fun. And I really have enjoyed uh, my favorite outcrop and the, and the Mars uh, programs as well. And so uh, uh, I hope you all will continue uh, to be involved. And if you're not a member of APG, well, please join. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we have a, a lot of fun and we, uh, we provide a lot, of, uh, a lot of good information to our membership. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rick. And I just want to say again, thank you for everyone to for participating and bringing your out, pictures of outcrops and sharing and sharing your experiences. And, and thank you for coming in and logging in from different parts of the world. We feel really, really grateful and appreciative. So thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend.